Can you hear me? Okay. Um, so, uh, is there a label for Intel? <laughs> sorry, sorry about that. <laughs> All right, um, so uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. And uh, um, okay, so uh, so today I'm going to talk about some some recent work uh, on this. Uh, I'll explain what it means: a high order of Hoff similarity. Uh, this is motivated by uh, all these beautiful experiments and uh, uh, theoretical work uh, that Philip and Oscar described on uh, Maury materials. Uh, but but this concept is uh, more general, as you will see in a minute. So. Um, so this is work uh, done with uh, postdocs at MIT, uh, Noah Yuan, uh, Hiroki Isobei, and uh, uh, Zhen Di. So um, let me start with a very uh, general introduction to uh, states, metallic states of matter. And uh, so take an example of an ordinary metal. Uh, a key characteristic is that uh, it has a Fermi surface uh, with a Fermi momentum. And uh, the very existence of a Fermi surface uh, <coughs> leads to a variety of con consequences. Uh, the metal metallic state has a finite compressibility, a finite uh, spin susceptibility, uh, and a finite uh, specific heat divided by temperature down to the zero temperature limit. And uh, in a non-interacting system, uh, all these susceptibilities are proportional to the uh, non-interacting uh, density of state. So um, in the presence of interactions, uh, what uh, we learned uh, from Landau's uh, Fermi-liquid theory is that uh, quality particles uh, remain uh, well-defined uh, excitations uh, when the energy of these quality particles are small, when these uh, excitations are close to the uh, Fermi surface. And a uh, pictorial way you can uh, understand this uh, is uh, think in the case of think about, uh, for example, in the non-interacting limit, uh, we can create an extra uh, electron above the Fermi energy. Uh, it's an exact energy eigenstate. Uh, when we turn on uh, interactions, uh, it's no longer an exact eigenstate anymore. This uh, state can decay into a multi-electron uh, hole uh, excitations. Uh, however, uh, in the uh, limit when the uh, uh, energy of this excitation of this uh, in the non-interacting limit is small, when this uh, extra hole you added to the system is close to the Fermi surface, uh, the phase space for scattering is uh, severely uh, restricted. Uh, in fact, the uh, quality particle scattering rate, both as the excitation energy squared, and this means that there is a well-defined quality particle near the Fermi surface. And uh, if you look at the uh, spectral function, uh, that instead of a delta function peak, now it's broadened, but this broadening uh, is uh, small. Uh, it's proportional to uh, the deviation from the Fermi energy uh, uh, squared. Uh, so this is, uh, the, basically the quasi-particle scattering rate is much smaller than the quasi-particle energy itself uh, in the limit when this uh, momentum of the quasi-particle is close to KF. So in that sense, uh, we still have uh, well-defined quasi-particles. And um, uh, uh, now interactions does uh, make uh, interesting uh, consequences. Uh, for example, if we look at the free energy of the Fermi liquid, yeah, I don't know why. Oh, the wrong button. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, ah, very high tech. Okay, so uh, so if you look at the uh, free energy of the system uh, at low temperature, you think of the Fermi liquid as a dilute gas of these uh, quasi particles, um, and uh, uh, the occupation of these quasi particles is called delta n. It's a deviation of the occupation with respect to the uh, equilibrium ground state uh, distribution. And then we can write down the uh, free energy at a finite temperature as a, a functional of these uh, distribu distributions. And uh, there's a, a leading term uh, which defines, this you can think of as a definition of the uh, quasi-particle energy, which can be different from the non-interacting uh, dispersion. And uh, in particular, uh, the renormalized dispersion uh, can be uh, captured in terms of a renormalized quasi-particle mass. And then there are additional terms which are quadratic to the uh, quasi-particle uh, distribution. And this captures the effect uh, that there is a, a interaction among these quasi-particles. And, uh, uh, and you take the free energy, which is shown here, and uh, one can deduce uh, all sorts of uh, 
response of the system to external perturbations. And uh, in particular, the uh, specific heat is basically uh, proportional to the non-interaction specific heat, but it's renormalized by the ratio of the, um, uh, is the quasi particle mass and the non-interacting uh, electron mass. And likewise, the compressibility and the spin susceptibility are all uh, renormalized. And in uh, the susceptibility, uh, the, not only the, the normalized mass enters, but also the, uh, the interactions, the F term uh, enters. So basically, uh, this is sort of the answer essence of the thermoliquid theory that quasi-particles are well-defined and they uh, renormalize the properties of the systems, but not dramatically different from uh, the non-interaction case. Now, um, uh, uh, we already heard from Philip's talk this morning uh, that uh, the direct fluid in graphene, uh, this is an example of a system, uh, a metallic state, uh, instead of with a full Fermi surface, uh, but with a Fermi point. Okay, it's a two-dimensional uh, system like graphene, like the surface state of topological insider. Uh, it has a single or you know, a few finite number of these uh, Fermi points. Uh, this also exists in three-dimensional systems, uh, such as sodium bismuth, uh, and these are Dirac and Wildstein metals. And again, in these systems, there's a, a Fermi a point. Uh, another type class of systems with Fermi points are one-dimensional metals. <coughs> and in this case, uh, uh, we can linearize the energy spectrum uh, near the Fermi energy, and we basically get uh, chiral uh, modes, uh, left-moving modes and right-moving modes. And again, we get uh, the Fermi uh, point. And um, in these systems, uh, there are uh, interesting uh, properties. And in particular, for example, if we look at the case of a one-dimensional Lacrimi liquid, um, uh, one can actually now use a field theory technique for deal with these systems, okay? The big difference between Fermi point and, and the Fermi surface is that the conventional field theory, okay, uh, developed in the context of high energy physics, in the context of the Wilson-Fisher theory, these are all essentially uh, uh, naturally built to describe systems with uh, point uh, excitations, where excitations, the phase space for excitations are, uh, 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 live uh, in the vicinity of a point in case space, for example, near k equals zero. So uh, this is why this type of technique is extremely uh, uh, convenient for uh, dealing with a one-dimensional metal. And uh, so this is what the field theory is. Uh, you have a, a dispersion, uh, left and right moving modes, which uh, can be mapped into the two components of a one-dimensional uh, direct equation. And then we can add uh, the effect of electron-electron interactions. And, uh, and this field theory can be analyzed and you know, people study this uh, for, for several decades and the properties of the liquid are now uh, well, well understood. Uh, and in contrast, uh, if we think about this, an ordinary Fermi surface, the excitation spectrum is much more sophisticated uh, than the case of a one-dimensional metal. Uh, and what is plotted here, uh, this uh, omega and Q plane, these are the uh, energy and the momentum of allowed uh, particle hole excitations. So uh, in the case of a one-dimensional uh, metal, for example, uh, if we want to increase the momentum by amount Q, one can uh, uh, kick an electron from below the uh, Fermi energy to above the Fermi energy, but it's only possible to do this uh, near plus Kf or minus Kf along a one-dimensional line. And in that case, the uh, state that you obtain uh, has an energy which is uh, basically linearly proportional to Q. Uh, so the phase space is very limited at small wave vector Q, okay? In contrast, if you take a case of a Fermi surface, uh, in order to uh, create an excitation, a particle excitation with a momentum Q, there are many ways of doing that. And in particular, uh, you can create a finite momentum excitation uh, at vanishing uh, energy, right? By, for example, by kicking an electron uh, uh, the, uh, in a region that is uh, perpendicular to the wave vector Q, right? You can create a, a very small energy and in, in fact, zero energy excitation. So the phase space for scattering is very different in the case of Fermi surface and in the case of Fermi point. And the field theory techniques are well suited for describing uh, systems with Fermi points. Um, so, uh, and this one dimensional Latinjo liquid uh, is a, a famous example of a, a non-Fermi liquid. Uh, if we look at the long wavelength properties of a Latinjo liquid, uh, and I've listed uh, some of them here, uh, looking at the density response, uh, it looks quite similar to a non-interacting electron gas in one dimension. 
the dense density correlator goes as a one over x squared. However, if you look at the pairing response, it becomes dramatically different, okay? Uh, so in any uh, non-interacting electron system, the pairing susceptibility has a logarithmic divergence uh, when there is a finite density state. But here, in this one-dimensional system, the pairing susceptibility uh, decays as a power law with an exponent which is two divided by g, and g is related to the interaction strength. So for repulsive interaction systems, g is bigger than one, so that the decay of the pairing susceptibility uh, is faster than uh, quadratic, or than one over x squared. So this is saying that a uh, repulsive electron gas in one dimensions uh, is, uh, uh, has a much weaker tendency towards superconductivity than the non-interacting case. Okay, this is, uh, uh, this is intuitively uh, uh, correct. Uh, but the important thing is that the now, if you look at these quantities, the density response and the pairing response, they have a different exponent, and this is the first signature of a non-Fermi liquid. Now, the most direct uh, property of a non-Fermi liquid is to look at the uh, single particle uh, Green's function, uh, whether the quasi-particle weight uh, is finite or not. Uh, and this is the single particle Green's function, uh, again, it decays as a power law with yet another exponent, which is you know uh, uh, one half of g plus g inverse. And uh, if we look at the momentum distribution function, which is basically the Fourier transform of the single particle Green's function in real space, and what we get is this. Okay, uh, now instead of having a uh, discontinuity across the Fermi momentum, we see that the uh, uh, electron distribution function has a power law similarity. Uh, at Kf. So this is a defining feature of a non-Fermi liquid, meaning that uh, uh, single electrons are not well-defined uh, excitations, are not long-lived excitations, uh, even in the vicinity of the Fermi surface, even in the vicinity of the Fermi level. Okay, and later we will see that uh, some high-dimensional generalization of this, so which I'll describe uh, in, in the second lecture. So. Um, so now we have described basically uh, systems uh, with uh, Fermi points, and uh, in one dimension and in two and three dimensions, you know, in graphing, for example, uh, these nodal semimetals, they are intermediate state between metal and insulator. Uh, instead of having a constant density state, uh, they have vanishing density states, and this leads to various interesting effects. Uh, you know, Philip described some of those. And uh, in this case, the Coulomb interaction, for example, leads to a logarithmic increase of the Dirac velocity. And um, so this leads to a sort of a summary of the review uh, that of, the, of, of known metals, right? Of the well-known metals, uh, ordinary metal has a finite Fermi surface with a finite density state at the Fermi level, while a, a nodal semi-metal in dimensions uh, greater than one has a vanishing density state uh, at the Fermi level. The question is, uh, what about uh, metals with a divergent uh, density state at the Fermi level, right? So this is the topic I'm gonna describe today, and uh, you know, for the lack of a better name, uh, you know, in contrast to semi-metals, we can call those with divergent density state as supermetals. <coughs> so um, one example, right, that is well known with metals with divergent density state come from uh, the Van Hoff singularity. And uh, for example, if you look at a simple type binding model on the square lattice, and you see that at a particular fitting, uh, the Fermi surface uh, touch uh, the um, uh, boundary of the Brillouin zone, and in this case, if you draw it in a repeated zone scheme, uh, you really see that the, the two pieces of Fermi surface intersect each other. So this is really a zoom in of this region shown here. And uh, in the vicinity of this uh, uh, point, if you look at the energy dispersion, uh, because of the uh, reflection symmetry with respect to x and y direction, uh, to the leading order, the energy dispersion takes the form kx squared minus ky squared. I have basically uh, scaled kx and ky so that the coefficient is uh, one and minus one. So with this dispersion, one can compute the density state. Uh, it has a logarithmic divergence, okay? So, uh, so this kind of, uh, I'm gonna show a lot of uh, plots like this. Uh, here, uh, the, these are the uh, energy contours in the uh, K space, and the color represents energy. And these lines are the uh, energy contours. So this energy dispersion is based along the axis? This, this is, a, yeah, uh, a zoom in of this region around here, right? Yeah. Um, these are actual Van Hove singularities. Uh, these are known as the Van Hove singularities. 
And that generic associated with this uh, critical points in the energy dispersion. And what I mean by critical points is uh, points in uh, K space where the velocity uh, vanishes, right? And you can see uh, that the vanishing of the velocity leads to non anarchist in denser state uh, just from the expression of denser states. Uh, it involves the integral of a K space, uh, but it has a one over the velocity, right? So when velocity vanishes, it potentially contributes uh, non anarchistic. Um, and interestingly, uh, this, uh, one can classify, as Van Hove did, uh, one can classify uh, these critical points uh, using the concept of topology. Okay? Uh, this is not topology of the electron wave function that, that Oscar just described. Uh, instead, these are basically a much simpler, like high school topology, let's say. Uh, these are really uh, basically defined as the following way. If we take uh, the uh, energy contour in the vicinity of these critical points where the velocity vanishes, then uh, to draw a closed contour around these critical points, there's a velocity field uh, on that contour. And uh, that velocity field defines a winding number, right? It can show that for energy extrema, such as an energy minimum or maximum, this winding number is always plus one. While for a saddle points, uh, this uh, winding number is minus one, okay? Uh, so this means that uh, these critical points are actually topological stable objects. So when you perturb the system, when you change the energy dispersion, the location of these critical points in k-space can change, but the existence cannot, okay? So the only way to uh, annihilate a, uh, to get rid of, for example, a set of points is to annihilate with an energy extrema so that the topological charge minus one and the topological charge plus one, they merge into each other and they pair <coughs> annihilate. Um, also, uh, it follows that because the energy dispersion are defined in a Brillouin zone, which is uh, equivalent to a torus, so uh, the total winding number uh, has to vanish, okay? Because uh, a to torus uh, has no boundaries. So if you look at the winding number, uh, the total winding number has to add up to zero. This immediately means that in the system uh, where the energy dispense uh, has a finite bound, then there has to be a certain number of energy minimum, a certain number of energy maximum. And in the simplest case, we have one energy minimum, one energy maximum. Uh, so, but energy minimum and maximum, they all have the same topological charge, which is plus one. So this immediately means that there has to be saddle points uh, somewhere uh, in the Brillouin zone. Okay, just from the fact that the Brillouin zone is uh, topologically equivalent to a torus, it follows that saddle points uh, must exist. So um, in other words, uh, this Van Hove singularity, uh, it should be uh, ubiquitous. In every energy band, there has to be Van Hove singularities. So this, all this is known for a long time. Uh, and uh, you know, obviously people have long been intrigued by uh, the Van Hove singularity on the electronic properties of metals. So in particular, when the Fermi level is tuned uh, to the vicinity of Van Hove singularity, this divergent density state uh, may lead to all sorts of uh, competing instabilities. Uh, I'll list some examples here. Uh, the ferromagnetism, superconductivity, uh, these are uh, two uh, 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 instabilities uh, that are present, uh, in, uh, always present. Uh, now, when the system has multiple by similarities at the same energy, then uh, one can also, uh, uh, there's additional uh, instabilities, uh, pneumaticity, density wave, etc. Yeah. Uh, so here, everything so far is 2D, and I'll show 3D in a minute. Yeah, the reason is that in 2D, uh, this uh, saddle points give you a divergent density state, which is logarithmic. Uh, so, so far, the statement is only two, 2D. Uh, so, so the existence of saddle points is generic, uh, so not in any dimension, because the Brillouin zone is always topologically equivalent to torus, a d-dimensional torus. Okay. It actually, it's dimensional torus. Right, d-dimensional torus, right, right. Uh, but the divergent density state is only for 2D. In fact, I'll come to that in a minute, yeah. Correct. So uh, if you have uh, this action point, that if you have a, a surface states of a topological uh, insulator, et cetera, uh, what happens is that the energy dispersion is only defined in the contractible region, not necessarily on the entire Brillouin zone. In fact, generally not on the entire Brillouin zone. That's right. Action, action. 
Right. So, uh, so, so what happens is that basically uh, uh, in all these uh, different susceptibilities, uh, they are proportional to the non-interacting susceptibility if we just take the simple RPA type of formula. Uh, and when the non-interacting uh, denser state diverges, uh, these susceptibilities uh, should diverge with it, at least by uh, simple, simple, uh, simple reasoning. So that's why the people have long been uh, uh, interested uh, in these Van Hove similarities in the context of cuprates, uh, strontium rosinates, uh, graphene, etc. And uh, this is an early paper that's talking about uh, monolayer graphene uh, under sufficiently high doping uh, that it may lead, and when the Fermi level is close to this Van Hove similarity, uh, interesting states like superconductivity uh, can appear. So, um, so some examples. Uh, so uh, strontium rosinate, okay. Uh, in strontium rosinate, uh, this, is, this material has been studied for uh, more than uh, three decades, uh, but only recently, relatively recently, uh, people uh, uh, started to uh, uh, apply strain, uniaxial strain to strontium rosinate, and, and very many interesting uh, results are obtained. Uh, this is from uh, Andy McKinsey's group. Uh, so, so, so these are the Fermi surface of strontium rosinate. It consists of three bands, and uh, only call attention to these gamma bands, Okay, which mostly come from the g x squared minus y squared uh, orbitals. And you see that this uh, gamma band has a large Fermi surface that is close to the boundary of the Brillouin zone uh, with a strain, uniaxial strain along the x direction. Uh, one can actually um, uh, tune the gamma band uh, so that the Fermi surface touch the Van Hove singularity uh, at the boundary of the Brillouin zone. And this is the calculation. Uh, you see that uh, uh, on the compression or the tension, the denser state uh, at the Fermi level increases uh, because the Van Hove singularity is now at the Fermi level. Now, interestingly, this material is a superconductor uh, with a TC of, of about one Kelvin. But uh, as you strain the sample, you see that the superconducting TC increases by almost a factor of three when the Fermi level is at the Van Hove singularity. And as you go strain it further, uh, the Van Hove singularity moved uh, uh, below the Fermi level, and superconducting TC drops down. Okay, so this again shows that you know uh, a, a dramatic uh, increase of superconducting TC by uh, by strain because the Van Hove singularity is tuned to the Fermi level. Um, you can also look at the property of the system uh, above TC, the resistivity above TC, and when the system is uh, unstrained, you see the resistivity is proportional to T squared. Uh, this is uh, you would expect from Fermi liquid theory. Also, if you strain the system uh, past the Van Hove singularity, again the resistivity is proportional to T squared. But when uh, for optimum strain, when the TC is maximum, when the Van Hove singularity is, is near the Fermi level, you also see this deviation from resistivity deviates from T squared. So all this uh, tells us that uh, when the Fermi level is close to Van Hove singularity, uh, interesting uh, effects uh, happens. So this is my whole thing I said, uh, back to Philip's question. Uh, so in two-dimensional system, it generically give you a divergent denser state, which is logarithmic, right? Uh, this is one type of supermetal, if you, you can call it that way. Uh, of course, the system with the uh, largest denser state are the flat band systems, where the uh, denser state is a delta function. Uh, and uh, uh, I think Oscar may talk more about that uh, in the next lecture. Uh, so what I'm going to focus on is this new type of a system that we stumbled upon recently. Um, so these are systems where the, uh, the denser state has a power law divergence. Okay, so this, this super metal. Uh, with, and this power law divergence really comes from a, a high order uh, dispersion, not k squared, but a high order. We call it high order by hosting value. Yes? Epsilon is bigger than one. is never bigger than one. In all, yeah, yeah. Delta function. function, exactly, exactly, yeah. It would be nice to <laughs> find someone. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so so um, so 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 the uh, uh, one example, uh, probably the earliest example I know of. Uh, so you know, more than almost ten years ago, we uh, and while at Harvard, uh, we studied a, a toy model of uh, of a tie binding model uh, on the triangle lattice with purely imaginary hopping, right? Purely imaginary hopping, and interestingly, uh, we get a Fermi surface that's like this. Uh, three straight lines which intersect at a single point. And that leads to, as I'll show you later, uh, that leads to a densest divergence, which is a power law with an exponent which is minus one third. And more recently, in the context of twist bilobiographing, 
we again noted that the Fermi contours, uh, as the Van Hoesting already, is very different from a, a ordinary one. Instead of two Fermi surface uh, touch each other, uh, cross each other at a finite angle, you see that two Fermi contours touch each other tangentially. It turned out this leads to a divergent density state, which is again a power law instead of logarithmic with the exponent, which is one quarter. So um, uh, before I describe uh, these two cases, uh, let me now move on to a, a simpler case first, right? Uh, let's now move on to three-dimensional systems. And in the original Van Hoff paper, he noticed that in the three-dimensional case, the distribution function, meaning the denser state, uh, is con itself is continuous, whereas its first derivative exhibits infinite discontinuities. What this means is that in a three-dimensional system, for a canonical Van, uh, Van Hoff singularity with you know, k-square dispersion, uh, the denser state is not divergent, it's actually finite. It's really the, uh, it has a kink instead of a divergence. Uh, in, uh, instead, only when you have high order dispersions can a uh, divergent denser state arise. Okay, so that's why uh, one of the uh, sort of a take home message is that if we take a three dimensional bulk material, uh, when you see denser state peaks in the system, these are not coming from conventional Van Hoesting singularities. Instead, they all come from high order Van Hoesting singularities or approximately high order Van Hoesting singularities. So take a k square dispersion in three dimensions, no matter how you arrange it, you will not be able to get a divergent denser state. Okay, so you really need a high order dispersion to do that. And, and let me give a simplest example. Uh, for example, if you have a dispersion which is k to the fourth power in three dimensions, then uh, just from the power counting, uh, you can find that the denser state has a divergent which is energy to the minus one quarter. And, and, you, know, and you can get this uh, by just uh, power counting in the following way. We know that the denser state has unit of, uh, of uh, momentum, uh, wave vector k to the power of d, d is spatial dimension, and then divide by energy. And when you have dispersion like this, uh, the wave vector k has a dimension of energy to the power of one fourth, right? So you take one fourth, multiply by the dim spatial dimension three, and then you, you, you divide by energy. And this gives you exponent minus one quarter, okay? So one thing uh, uh, I also want to uh, emphasize is that this divergent denser state purely comes from the vicinity of this uh, k equals zero. And uh, uh, when I perform this uh, denser state calculation, there's an integration over momentum this upper bound of the momentum integration, which is typically, you know, uh, in reality, it has to be bounded by the Brillouin size, but one can actually extend that momentum, uh, UV momentum uh, uh, cutoff to infinity, and the integral is still converging. So what all this what means is that, that all this density divergence come from the uh, IR, from the infrared, from the vicinity of this, of this uh, high order shadow point. And in this case, it's really high order uh, energy minimum. Now, can this dispersion be realized in real materials, right? Now, if you take real materials, uh, uh, it's the dispersion is not completely isotropic. Uh, even in the very high symmetry crystals, such as cubic crystals, uh, the dispersion, the symmetry allowed dispersion near the gamma <coughs> point has a falling form. It ha generally has a k-square term, it's always allowed. It can have a k to the fourth term, but it can also have this additional term, one additional term. Okay, in the cubic crystals up to the fourth order, this is the most general dispersion. Uh, this B term uh, breaks the continuous rotation symmetry into the cubic uh, point group. And now, if the quadratic term vanishes, uh, say you know, if, if one is lucky, one finds a material where the quadratic term vanishes, uh, then uh, the existence of the additional term uh, doesn't change this density state divergence because uh, again, this energy is proportional to k to the fourth power still holds, and you get divergent to the exponent minus one quarter. Now, if in the material when the quadratic term is not exactly zero, but if it's very small, then what happens is that density state still has approximately this uh, power law divergence uh, uh, for energies above a threshold, okay? And the threshold is defined by h squared divided by this coefficient a or b. So uh, within a very small energy range, close to zero energy, uh, the system does not have a divergence denser state. In fact, it vanishes here. But above that energy, above that small energy cutoff, the denser state is still approximately power law. Okay, so this led us to search for uh, high order of in three-dimensional materials. And uh, 
the system we came uh, assembled upon is actually quite interesting, and uh, I feel particularly uh, uh, it's particularly good opportunity to talk about it here in the magma lab, uh, because these materials are the high temperature superconductors of the old days uh, before the cuprate was discovered. These are A15 intermetallic compounds. So the formula, chemical formula A3B. And these are the examples, niobium tin, niobium germanium, uh, et cetera. These are arranged in a cubic crystal. Uh, the TC is about 20 Kelvin. And also uh, the technology for growing these materials into wires are extremely well developed for several decades. And uh, in particular, niobium tin and niobium germanium are used for high field magnets. And uh, uh, there's a recent, uh, uh, a lot of activity that's CERN for the large uh, hydrogen collider that uh, they are installing uh, right now as we speak, these niobium tin uh, magnets. Okay. So, uh, so this material has been studied for a long time. If we look at the, the normal state, uh, temperatures above 20 Kelvin, what's interesting, what I, I stumbled upon is that if you look at the magnetic stability, okay, uh, it uh, increases rapidly at, low, at the lower temperature. Uh, the system is nowhere close to a magnet, so magnetic state, it's a, it's a metal. Okay. Uh, so where does this, you know, we know that in ordinary metal, the magnetic susceptibility should be essentially temperature independent when temperature is below the Fermi energy. Right? And in real metal, in, in typical metals, the Fermi energy is, you know, is very high, like 10,000 uh, degrees. So, uh, but in this system, you see a, 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 a dramatic increase of magnetic susceptibility at the lower temperature. Also, if you look at the resistivity, it's very strange. Uh, this resistivity has this dependence, which looks like, you know, it's a, uh, uh, not only not T squared, maybe it's T squared very low uh, temperature, but over a wide temperature range, right, above essentially 50 Kelvin all the way to uh, almost 1,000 Kelvin, the resistivity is strongly sublinear, right? So, so there has been a lot of uh, essentially uh, uh, study that uh, this perhaps is related to features in the denser state. So what we uh, look at uh, using the density functional uh, uh, methods this is work by my postdoc Yang Zhang. We isolated uh, the features in the denser states uh, in momentum space. So this is the uh, uh, energy dispersion. What you see there, there are uh, very flat bands uh, near the gamma points. And, uh, uh, and, and uh, uh, there's the denser states, uh, which is very close to the Fermi level, only 4 milliEV above. Um, now, because the physics, uh, the relevant bands is near the gamma point, we can now use this k dot p theory that I just described and try to uh, fit the dispersion. And uh, this again is dispersion with a k-fourth term, with a cubic k-fourth term, uh, with a quadratic term. And this is the fitting. And you see that in a large range of momentum, almost half of the size of Brillouin zone, uh, the dispersion fits very nicely with this very simple analytical formula. Uh, and when we look at the denser state, Coming from this particular band, we see that the denser state has a power law divergence, and this is log log plot of the denser state as a function of energy. And uh, you see that over you know, almost two decades of energy, it falls into a straight line uh, with the statutory minus one fourth that you expect from this dispersion. So this uh, also, you know, when we look at the minus susceptibility, we fit it with this power law with statutory minus a quarter. And we see the fits fits very well, okay. And the deviation only uh, onsets at low temperature, okay. And that's because, uh, as, as I said, at very uh, low energy, this k squared term becomes dominating over the k fourth term, so the system flows back to uh, Fermi liquid. Okay. So this is basically an example where, uh, in a three dimensional material, uh, over a wide temperature range, you see the physics is controlled by a power law diverging denser state uh, of a supermetal, okay? So um, now uh, this also brings me to sort of the uh, case of a two-dimensional material. We see that in order to find this, uh, so you know, we searched many materials and uh, uh, this niobium tin is the, the best example, almost the best example we, we found. Uh, there's always some residue perturbation, right? That is not exactly at a supermetal. Uh, uh, so only on a finite temperature range, the physics is controlled by the supermetal. Uh, but what about uh, two-dimensional materials which are tunable? Right? Can we tune the system to turn it into uh, supermetal? 
So um, this brings me to the Smori uh, materials. And uh, um, as you already heard from the uh, previous lecture, that uh, uh, after the discovery of superconductivity increased by the graphene, the steel really exploded. There's uh, all sorts of interesting phenomena. Uh, in addition to superconductivity, correlated insular, there's also this uh, turning insulator, quantum non pulse days, uh, and et cetera. And uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a very uh, impressionist view right, so of the Mori systems. Right? Now I think of these uh, water ripples as being like Mori. So uh, I'm going to focus based on just one aspect, right? uh, this is my whole similarity. Uh, again, uh, on the experimental side, this is known for quite some time. This is work from Ivo Andrew's group back in 2010. Uh, when you look at the STM uh, tunneling uh, denser states, uh, the Van Hove similarity is generically present, right? Because you take a pristine graphene, the denser state is linear as a function of energy. There's no interesting feature to near the low energy. Uh, but when you, uh, 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 when Mori bands start to form, right? That uh, uh, the system breaks up into many, many Mori bands. And as we just said that the theorem of Van Hove is that within any energy, isolated energy bands, there has to be Van Hove similarities. So that's why every Mori band, there is a PIDD peak. So when you come to the, close to the magic angle, you see that this Van Hove uh, peak is uh, now closer and closer towards the Fermi energy. Uh, it's telling you the overall energy scale of these bands becomes smaller and smaller. So um, now, in 2D materials, one can use uh, gating to bring the Fermi level to this uh, whole similarity. So uh, moreover, the energy dispersion can be tuned uh, by the twist angle, by the electric field, et cetera. So this leads to a very rich uh, phase space as a function of density, electric field, uh, temperature. And we see that, for example, uh, at high temperature, when the physics is governed by the non-impacting physics, uh, as you uh, Fermi level sweep across the Van similarity, you change from electron-like Fermi surface to four-like Fermi surface. Uh, but what happens at low temperature? Right? At low temperature, because of divergent tensor state, we expect interaction effects are very strong. So perhaps the system becomes symmetry breaking, uh, or perhaps the system remains metallic uh, down to the zero temperature limit. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure because uh, in that when they merge, right, the dispersion is linear in one direction, quadratic in the other direction. Right? There, there, well, yeah, there is a subtle point. That's right. So uh, correct. That's, you know, in the twisted battle graph, in, in fact, that is why, that is how, uh, yeah, if you look at this, this experiment, yeah. Yeah, this is actually a very nice paper, you know, 10 years ago. <coughs> That's exactly how they uh, explain this Van Hove similarity. So you take two drag cones, right? You offset them slightly in momentum space. Uh, each drag cone give you uh, a conical dispersion. And when they hybridize, uh, there is a Van Hove similarity because the dispersion is going upwards in one direction and bending downwards in the other direction, right? That's a canonical uh, subtle point, this k square dispersion. Exactly, that is what happens, for example, here. Yeah, but I'll show you that things get even more interesting when you're close to the magic angle. Okay, so, um, right, so, uh, so, so now I'm gonna describe uh, basically the whole physics uh, in 2D materials, uh, but uh, uh, instead of, let me first describe this. Uh, this uh, we've already heard a lot about the twisted by graphene. Uh, I want to uh, uh, change the topic a little bit. Uh, so let's say, uh, we now look at this new uh, experiments from the uh, Columbia group on this uh, twisted bilayer uh, tungsten disilinite. This is a transition metal ditriprimide. Um, so this system, let me first maybe describe the system a little bit more. Uh, if you look at a single layer of uh, WSE2, it's a semiconductor with a band gap about 1.5 electron volt. And uh, uh, we're gonna talk about uh, a P-doped uh, tungsten disilinite, so only the valence band is relevant here. And uh, the top of the valence band uh, uh, is located at the K and K prime point, the two valleys. Um, but uh, unlike the case of graphene, uh, there's no drag point, right? Because the, the parabolic bands at the K and K prime point, but there's a strong spin orbit interaction uh, with, of the icing type, meaning that uh, at a given valley, there's a spin up and spin down, which has a very large uh, energy splitting. And uh, so if you look at low energy physics, that's relevant here, essentially the, there's a spin polarized electrons at the K valley and opposite the spin polarized electrons at the K prime valley. Right, the spin degrees of freedom is locked to the value degrees of freedom. 
Okay, and uh, this is a continuum model introduced by um, McDonald group. Uh, so basically we have a parabolic dispersion on the two layers. Right? So when you ha have a two layers of WIC2 with a uh, finite twist angle, uh, now the K points of one layer and the K points of the other layer are offsetting momentum space. So that's why there's uh, this offset K plus and K minus here. And then there's uh, uh, the two layers can be at a different uh, potential energy when you have a, a displacement field. This is represented by delta B and delta T. Uh, there's also interlayer tunneling term. Right? Now the one interesting feature is that uh, because uh, the uh, band edge is located at K point, uh, when you twist the two layers, uh, the momentum offset are different of the two layers. So this K plus and K minus are different. So you can perform a gauge transformation uh, uh, to remove the K plus and K minus from diagonal term. But what you, uh, the price you pay is that now the off diagonal tunneling term becomes complex. So this is an, uh, a key feature, okay? A uh, generic feature uh, in Mori materials where the uh, band edge is located at the K points uh, is that the effective tunneling strength is complex. And uh, uh, this leads to a very interesting uh, dis uh, dispersion, uh, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, but basically the interlayer tunneling uh, opens up uh, these uh, band gaps between different Mori bands. And we are only interested in the low, topmost uh, Mori valence band. Okay. So the experiment uh, is shown here. Uh, so uh, basically this is the temperature, this is the function of the density. Uh, charging relative is somewhere here. And as we introduce holes into the system, uh, at half filling of the topmost Mori bands, we see that an inflating state uh, arises at low temperature. And uh, this is the resistivity uh, as a function of temperature at a different density. And you see that away from the uh, half fitting, the system is metallic, but uh, at half fitting, uh, at low temperature, uh, inflating states arise. Now, uh, now, one thing that's uh, interesting about this system is that uh, it does not require a particular magic angle. So this insulating state is present uh, at wide range of twist angles from uh, you know, this five degree all the way to probably three degree that's covered in this paper. Uh, also, this insulating state is turned out to be uh, extremely sensible, sensitive to uh, the displacement field. When you change the uh, uh, electrostatic energy between the two top and bottom layers, uh, only in a small range of this uh, bias, electric bias, the insulating state appears. Okay. So uh, this got us uh, interested. And uh, um, we started looking at the uh, band structure uh, in more detail uh, using this continuum model that I just described. Uh, this is the result at four uh, degree. This is work with uh, Yi Zhen at MIT, I shall have a reference in a minute. Uh, notice that in this system, uh, the bandwidth is uh, about 50 milli electron volt. The characteristic interaction strength E squared over epsilon L, where uh, epsilon is dielectric constant, L is a Mori uh, wave uh, length, is about 30 milli electron volt. So actually the bandwidth is bigger than the interaction strength. And uh, the insulin gap is only three milli electron volt. So this suggests that we may be able to understand uh, some of the physics uh, starting from uh, the band picture, starting from the Fermi surface. Uh, and, and so um, this is the Fermi surface uh, at uh, the feeling of uh, n equal one. n equal one is one hole per unit cell. Um, this is where the insulin state was experimentally observed. Um, and this is what the Fermi surface looks like, okay? Uh, so you see that there's a, a Fermi surface that almost extends to the corner of the mini Brown zone. So again, remember that uh, there are two valleys and the two valleys are decoupled at a single particle level. So I've drawn the uh, Fermi contour of the two valleys separately. So within each valley, you see that the Fermi surface does not have a, a, a K2 minus K symmetry. Uh, this again is a generic feature, also arises in twisted by graphene as Oscar just explained. All this is related to the fact that the effective Hamiltonian within a single valley uh, is not time reversal invariant. Okay, time reversal symmetry really interchange the two valleys, but doesn't act within a single valley. And um, unlike twisted by graphene, uh, there's no two-fold rotation symmetry. Uh, so that's why uh, the, the, uh, the system in fact has a finite uh, effective flux within each valley. So um, what do you, uh, this is the Fermi contour, uh, and if you look at the denser states, uh, you notice that the, the, there is a very pronounced denser state peak, uh, which is close to the Fermi level, and moreover, 
if we change the displacement field, uh, this tensor state peak can come uh, close and even pass the Fermi level. So this plot shown here is the uh, energy of the density state peak coming from the whole singularity relative to the uh, Fermi level right at the n equal one feeling. Okay, and you see that uh, that uh, uh, in the wide range of displacement fields, this Mahov singularity is very close to the Fermi level. Now, um, if you look at again this kind of a, a Fermi contour, it doesn't look like a, an ordinary Mahov singularity. What you see is essentially remember the Brillouin going periodic. So this point is really the same as this point. Uh, uh, this point is same as this point, and uh, this point is the same as as this point. So it's much more uh, convenient to uh, draw it in a different way. Let's draw the uh, Fermi contour centered at the corner of the mini Brillouin zone. Okay, uh, this is centered at K prime point from one valley. What you see is you see that three pieces of Fermi surface uh, almost intersect each other uh, right at the center, right? And uh, uh, and the other valley, the dispersion is just the uh, you know can be obtained by time reversal. Okay. So uh, all this can be captured again by looking at, yeah, five minutes, okay, uh, perfect, yeah. All this can be understood by just looking at the energy dispersion, again, expanded around this uh, K point. Uh, the K point has a three-fold rotation symmetry, so to lowest order, we can have a K square term, uh, but then to next order, we can have a, a K cube term of this particular form, KY to the third power minus three times KY KX squared. This is invariant on the three-fold rotation, and again, we're gonna see that this coefficient of the k square term uh, can be tuned by the displacement field. And in particular, when alpha is zero, when alpha is zero, uh, this con energy contour of this dispersion with only k uh, cube term has three straight lines that intersect uh, at the center. So this again is a high order by whole singularity coming from the k cube dispersion. Uh, now, uh, if you again look at the topological charge associated with the winding number of the velocity field, it carries topological charge minus two instead of minus one. Okay, so it's different from the ordinary Van singularity. And from uh, power counting, you can again see the density state has a divergence, which was exponent, which is minus one third. Okay. When alpha is finite, what you see is that this single uh, high order saddle point split into three ordinary saddle points plus one energy extrema right at the center. Okay, so in this process, you see topological charge is conserved uh, because you know, uh, ordinary saddle point has topological charge minus one multiplied by three and the, the energy extrema has a topological charge plus one. So it adds up to minus two. Okay, so um, essentially if you look at the whole dispersion, right, this is really close to uh, having a small triangle contour, right, which is, which means that this is well captured by this model. Uh, and, th and this is most general dispersion up to third order in K. So, <coughs> so um, uh, let me just summarize uh, that uh, in this twisted uh, WSD2, what you see is that uh, the density state divergence near the half filling is really controlled by a, a simple by whole singularity, okay? And uh, at a particular uh, dispersion field, uh, this quadratic term vanishes. We have an exact high order by whole singularity where the three Fermi surface uh, intersect at a single point. So, um, and you know, when you are slightly away from this, uh, the density state has basically a large divergence uh, over a wider energy range controlled by this, uh, this super metal uh, behavior. Uh, so this leads to basically power law uh, divergence susceptibilities, uh, both in the ferromagnetic channel and in the inter-valley uh, dense wave channel. So uh, I think I'm gonna stop here and uh, leave the rest to the next lecture. So. We're going to discuss this intervalle density wave next. Okay, thanks. <laughs>
in this case, in this case, you see the occupied states and the unoccupied states, right? They are exactly at opposite momentum relative to the center. So yeah, exactly. So it's again very different from the conventional um, Van Hoff similarity. In the conventional Van Hoff similarity, you know, if you choose a uh, uh, basic k and minus k, right? They are e at equal energy. Here they are at opposite energy. Yeah, that's a very good question. Yeah, yeah, yeah please. So you have some pressure dependent study on this von der Herzen method. Right. Would you say that it's a chiral circuit at all? In fact, it doesn't look at all, right? It doesn't look at all, right? Because uh, the, uh, the Van Hoff singularity, when it's come to the Fermi level, uh, the Van Hoff singularity has the time rule thing variant momentum. So if the system is a P-wave pairing, the order parameter will have to vanish there instead of being um, finite there. Yeah. So it seems to me that, at least naively, the P-wave pairing does not take advantage of the whole scenario, which is hard to reconcile with the strong increase of Tc. No, no, no. Uh, in fact, in this case, the, the density state is symmetric. Oh. Yeah, in this case. The Energy is the order function k, right? But uh, the denser state, uh, in this in this example, is symmetric uh, at plus e and minus e. But again, there are other cases. I'll talk about another case in the next lecture where the, it's asymmetric. So there are really different cases one has to look at. No, so that's, that's what I want to talk to you about. <laughs> Right, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. But, but it's still applicable in that classification? Right, so uh, the cl particular classification I've talked about assume that the, uh, you have isolated points. The, uh, the basically, the, I assume that the critical points are isolated. Uh, in the case of the Mexican hat, right, it's really a ring of the critical points. But that case is kind of a, a little bit fine tuned, I would say, uh, because in reality, there's always some warping effects. Of course, dwarfing can be very, very, very small energy scale. Though. We really don't need to worry about it. Yeah, but it, you know, so far, so far, everything I'm talking about is that, like uh, uh, critical points, isolated points. It's a very good question. Yeah. 